In May of 1902, the thriving town of Saint-Pierre on the island of Martinique was destroyed in a near instant. This town held a population of close to 30,000 people, and unfortunately, within a span of only three minutes, more than 29,000 people met their end, as the entire city suddenly became blanketed and fatally scorched by a single pyroclastic flow, which descended during the climax of this event and hurtled towards the town of Saint-Pierre at a terrifying pace, striking the residents seemingly without warning. Unfortunately, this is anything but true, and this town had many warning signs and ample time to clear, and many wanted to, as the volcano known as Mount Pelay began to demonstrate the very clear fact that it was awakening from its slumber and doing so in a violent way. But politics led to the population forcibly being kept in the city, trapped to a fatal fate, with anyone attempting to flee the town being forced to return under the threat of imprisonment. And this was done because an election was due to be held soon, and the governor wanted the numbers to be high in the day. He even convinced the local papers to downplay the event. What a truly despicable excuse for a man. In total, they had around six months worth of warning signs that this event was coming. And during that time, a clear rise in intensity was occurring at Mount Pelay. Unfortunately, pyroclastic flows weren't even known about in 1902, which is perhaps the reason why this level of ignorance was displayed. Either way, this site is truly one of immense tragedy. This was the worst volcanic eruption that would occur in the 20th century. But what's even stranger is the events that took place before it occurred. Mainly, the event in which the town was suddenly swarmed by venomous snakes and poisonous and biting insects that were fleeing the slopes of the volcano and heading towards lower ground in a frenzy-like state, where they then entered the town and caused complete chaos. So this episode is about the St. Pierre snake invasion of 1902. Before this final climactic eruption that buried and ultimately destroyed the town and the residents of St. Pierre, warnings were frequent and varied. From earthquakes to large sulfurous gas emissions to explosive phreatic eruptions. These eruptions eventually morphed into the climax, which was the phreatomagmatic event that occurred, which ultimately buried St. Pierre. This happened because the rocks surrounding the magma chamber were cracked and weakened enough by the many weeks of phreatic eruptions that had occurred, and now water could now penetrate and directly make contact with the magma inside the magma chamber. And as soon as this happened, the intense explosion that occurred and that buried the town and wiped the entire population out in under 180 seconds did so because an unbelievable amount of water suddenly mixed with magma. I made a video on the differences between phreatic and phreatomagmatic eruptions quite a while ago, so the quality is probably pretty bad, but I'll leave the link to that in the description box down below. But this video isn't about the volcanic eruption, it's about the biblical style plague it ushered forth, which is a true anomaly, at least to me. I haven't actually read or come across another story like this, so please leave a comment if you know of something that's similar to this. On May 5th of 1902, things began to dramatically dial up a notch in intensity as the first deaths would occur. A massive lahar flowed downstream, destroying a sugar processing plant instantly and killing almost two dozen people. May 5, 1902, around noon, an immense torrent of hot mud and water burst from the crater lake and flooded into the channel of Riviere Blanche. In its path was a sugar mill. Moving at terrible speed, the flood of mud and debris buried the mill and killed 25 workers. Only a few dead trees mark where the mill once stood. Even as the volcano's activity continued to increase, a committee of Saint-Pierre citizens concluded that there is nothing in the activity of Pele that warrants a departure from Saint-Pierre. Following this, the snakes and insects would then descend. The residents of Saint-Pierre were beset upon suddenly, when the many critters that lived upon the slopes began to descend by the tens of thousands, stirred into a panic-like craze by the events that were taking place. This flood of animals included massive venomous pit vipers, which were up to 2 meters or 6.5 feet long, accompanied by poisonous centipedes and a myriad of different biting ant species, affectionately dubbed crazy ants, which swarmed the town of Saint-Pierre, causing absolute chaos and claiming the lives of at least 50 people, most of which were unfortunately children. This nightmarish situation 
first began with waves of red and yellow ants and large poisonous centipedes. They hurriedly trekked down the slopes of Martinique's Mount Pelee, scuttling over roads and tracks, indiscriminately attacking anything they came across. Unfortunately, this meant the workers in the nearby cane fields who got a first taste of what was to come. They then invaded the local landowner's house before moving on to the city. After this, the snakes began their exodus. Hundreds of snakes, including deadly venomous pit vipers, slithered down the flanks of the volcano, directly into the town of Saint-Pierre, biting and terrifying every man, woman, child and animal in the town. It was absolute pandemonium. Everywhere, screams and bellows of animals and people in pain and distress could be heard as ants climbed everything they could, biting and clawing their way up any human or animal, whilst massive poisonous centipedes stung on contact and large snakes bit and injected venom into their targets indiscriminately. Soldiers attempted to protect the townspeople by shooting the snakes. A futile attempt to restore sanity to a situation one might expect to read in the Bible rather than see in reality. All up, 50 people met their end, along with many animals. Eventually, the insects and animals had cleared to lower ground as they continued to flee from Mount Pelé's destruction. You'd think everyone would GTFO right about now, true? I mean, who in their right mind would actually stay after this happened? They even had an additional three days to clear before the end. But, as previously mentioned, an act of selfishness by a foolish, gluttonous and soulless individual would seal the fate of 29,000 people by literally preventing them from fleeing by law, and even going as far as to returning those who fled back to the town. And only two people would survive the climactic phreatomagmatic eruption that would inevitably bury the beautiful town of Saint-Pierre, once known as Little Paris, extinguishing all life in under a mere 180 seconds. So this is the story of perhaps the most insane side effect of an explosive volcanic eruption, aside from the obvious. In the heart of Victoria, where the air is crisp and the horizon is marked by snowy peaks, stands the revered Mount Buller Ski Resort. More than just a winter haven, this mountain cradles a tale woven over eons. This narrative captures the very essence of the Earth's geological ballet. Looming over the vast expanse of Victoria's highlands, an iconic part of the Alpine region, Mount Buller is not just a sentinel of the Great Dividing Range, it is also a silent witness to nature's fiery drama. Below its ski trails, beneath the powder and pine, lies a colossal secret. A sprawling batholith, the remnants of an ancient and mighty magma chamber. A chamber that was not merely a geological feature, but the very engine of a supervolcano that once roared and reshaped the contours of this land. This magma chamber's origin is a tale of Earth's plates in a fierce embrace. To the east, they collided and contorted in a dance of geological proportions. This dance, a subduction event, birthed the Buller Batholith, and concurrently enriched the renowned Walhalla Goldfields, marrying fire with fortune. Imagine skiing atop a vast bed of granodiorite, its grains telling tales of eons past. This granodiorite is about 380 million years old, and it's hidden beneath snow and history. Because this very granodiorite was once the volatile fuel of a supervolcano. This supervolcano burst forth from a vulnerable point, a zone of weakness nudged by an older, wiser volcanic sill. But to truly understand Mount Buller's volcanic legacy, one must delve into its three-act saga. The opening act showcased torrents of andesitic lava flowing with majesty and might. Though their debut was explosive, it was merely a prelude to the symphony of fury that awaited. These initial eruptions, though awe-inspiring, were also treacherously dangerous, painting a vivid picture of nature's duality. Then, as if taking a breath, the mountain entered a deceptive interlude. The second act was marked by a dormant phase, a silence that belied the tumult brewing beneath. The andesite ceiling touch was but a temporary lid on a pot that was simmering with increased vigour. Deep within, the magma chamber underwent a transformation, a metamorphosis. It devoured surrounding continental rocks, growing richer and more volatile with silica. And then, with a crescendo of geological fury, the final act was unveiled. No longer could the chamber contain its rage. With an eruption that dwarfed all before, rhyolite surged forth in a cataclysmic display. 
the land was swallowed by tempestuous pyroclastic waves, rendering it a realm of death and desolation. This supervolcanic eruption was nature's magnum opus, leaving behind an indelible mark in the form of ring faults and a mysterious caldera that's visible alongside the baffle if that fueled it. Today this caldera whispers its secrets to those who listen, its presence echoing through the magmatic imprints of the land. So as you carve your way down Mount Buller's slopes, remember the symphony of fire and fury that once played below. For in the dance of ice and flame, Buller stands as an eternal testament to our planet's ever-evolving saga. Thanks for watching. Nestled amidst the serene landscapes of Wyoming lies a tale of nature's raw power waiting to be told. Yellowstone's tranquil geysers and pristine beauty conceal a tumultuous past. Approximately 640,000 years ago, this peaceful land was the epicenter of a cataclysmic event known as the Lava Creek Super Eruption. This event forever reshaped North America. While today's Yellowstone captivates visitors with its geothermal wonders and its vast wilderness, its geological narrative is a story of three colossal eruptions. However, it's the Lava Creek eruption that arguably stands out the most in this trilogy of geological fury. To grasp its sheer magnitude, one must envision an explosion 2,500 times more potent than the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens. Earning its title of Mega Colossal, this eruption spewed a staggering 1,000 cubic kilometers of volcanic material, or 239 cubic miles, its ash even finding its way down to the Gulf of Mexico. One of the most enduring remnants of the Lava Creek eruption is the tough layer it released. This layer of consolidated volcanic ash, transitioning from hues of pink to muted greys, paints a vivid narrative of the eruption's scale and reach. Composed predominantly of rhyolite, it speaks of magma so viscous that its explosive release was nothing short of monumental. The eruption's aftermath was marked by layers of ash and the formation of the Yellowstone Caldera, a vast depression measuring approximately 30 by 45 miles or 48 to 72 kilometers wide. This crater-like structure stands as a testament to the eruption's immense power, resulting from the ground's collapse when the magma chamber emptied. Beyond its geological impact, the eruption's ecological footprint was profound. Immediate surroundings were transformed by pyroclastic flows and thick ash deposits. On a global scale, the eruption introduced what might be termed a volcanic winter, with volcanic ash and gases permeating the atmosphere leading to cooler global temperatures and disrupted ecosystems. Nature, however, is tenacious. In the aftermath of such devastation, the region witnessed the emergence of resurgent domes, a testament to the continued influence of subterranean magma. Rhyolite lava flows signaled Yellowstone's enduring volcanic spirit, reminding us that this region remains geologically active. From the perspective of early humans, this eruption would have reshaped their entire world. As landscapes transformed and resources became scarce, adaptability became their lifeline, a testament to the resilience of life in the face of nature's fury. In the modern era, Yellowstone attracts millions with its beauty, but it also garners the vigilant gaze of scientists. Equipped with cutting-edge technology, they monitor the region's every tremor and geyser eruption, ensuring we're prepared for any potential future geological events. As we reflect on the Lava Creek eruption, we're reminded of our planet's dynamic nature and the tales embedded within its very fabric. Such events emphasize the delicate balance of nature and the awe-inspiring, often humbling narratives waiting to be discovered. Our exploration of Earth's chronicles is far from over, and as always, there are more stories waiting just beneath the surface. Thanks for watching. Nestled in the heart of North America, stretching across Wyoming, Montana, and Idaho, Yellowstone National Park is more than just a haven for wildlife and nature enthusiasts. It's a living testament to Earth's tumultuous geological past and the resilience of nature. But beyond its scenic beauty and geothermal wonders, there's a deeper narrative, one that intertwines cataclysmic eruptions, hidden mineral treasures, and the enduring spirit of preservation. Long before it became a cherished national park, the Yellowstone region was a hotspot of geological activity. Beneath its serene landscapes, the Yellowstone hotspot, fueled by a molten plume of magma rising from deep within the Earth's mantle, was silently brewing. 
As the North American plate drifted over this hotspot, magma chambers swelled, setting the stage for numerous eruptions that would reshape the continent. Around 2.1 million years ago, the ground beneath Yellowstone led to the Huckleberry Ridge eruption. This wasn't a short-lived spectacle, but a multi-phase event that spanned decades or more. Out of the three recent eruptions unleashed here, this eruption was the most powerful. It released more than double the amount of material than the supervolcanic eruption that we covered in yesterday's video when we looked at Yellowstone's most recent super eruption. Link to that in the description. In today's video, we'll take a look at Yellowstone's Huckleberry Ridge super eruption. It's often said that Yellowstone has had three supervolcanic eruptions. This isn't true, only two have taken place here. Instead, the truth is that three caldera forming eruptions have taken place here. Yesterday we covered the super eruption that released 1000 cubic kilometers or 240 cubic miles of volcanic material. Today's super eruption released more than double that. In the middle of the two though, another small eruption was strong enough to produce a caldera known as the Mesa Falls eruption. It only released an estimated 280 cubic kilometers or 67 cubic miles worth of tephra. If this went off today, we'd notice its effects in places far and wide. But the word only is used sparingly here, as this is powerful enough to affect the climate of the entire planet. If this went off today, we'd notice its effects in places far and wide. But back to the big one. The initial outburst unleashed pyroclastic flows that scorched vast territories. As the eruption evolved, the Huckleberry Ridge Tephra, a vast expanse of volcanic ash and debris, was propelled into the stratosphere, eventually settling over a significant portion of what is now the United States. This ash layer, still evident in geological formations, is a silent reminder of the eruption's magnitude. The climax of this volcanic event birthed the original Yellowstone Caldera, a depression that captures the essence of the park's volatile past. This occurred when the magma chamber became unstable after much of it was released during the eruption, leading to a significant collapse as the earth above filled the void. In the immediate aftermath, the region resembled an alien landscape, with an entirely new topography. But nature, in its timeless way, embarked on a journey of healing and transformation. The nutrient-rich volcanic soil breathed life back into the land, paving the way for the thriving ecosystems we witness today. In the present day, it's challenging to work out the shape and size of the original caldera as it's been changed by subsequent eruptions. But geologists have painstakingly worked to map the area out, and we have a pretty clear picture today. The caldera from this eruption is referred to as the Island Park Caldera. 2,450 cubic kilometers or 590 cubic miles of material is thought to have been unleashed during this event, making it one of the largest known eruptions in the Yellowstone hotspot's history. The volcanic winter would have been a harrowing event to have lived through, lasting for years to decades in length, due to just how much solar reflecting aerosols were pumped into the stratosphere by the ash plume, only for it to be spread planet wide by the trade winds. But Yellowstone's story isn't just about its volcanic roots. The park is a treasure trove of minerals. From the rhyolite and obsidian formations that hint at its fiery past, to the geothermal display of sulfur-laden fumaroles and the cascading travertine terraces of Mammoth Hot Springs, Yellowstone is a geologist's dream. Recognizing the region's unparalleled geological and ecological significance, the US government in a visionary move in 1872 declared Yellowstone a national park, and it was the first of its kind planet-wide. Now this wasn't merely a nod to its beauty, but a commitment to protect the peace of the Earth's dynamic history. With this designation, pursuits like mining, which once eyed the park's mineral wealth, were halted, ensuring that Yellowstone's legacy remained undisturbed. I personally am against this. I mean, this park's gonna blow up one day. You might as well get what riches you get now, but it is what it is. Today, as visitors wander through Yellowstone with its predictable geysers and diverse habitats, they're walking through pages of Earth's geological diary. The park stands as a symbol of nature's might, its ability to rejuvenate, and our collective responsibility to preserve its wonders. So the next time you find yourself marveling at Yellowstone's beauty, remember you're witnessing a tale of volcanic fury, nature's resilience, and a commitment to conservation that spans generations. Thanks for watching. 2019, the discovery of a new and thankfully extinct supervolcano that left a caldera twice the size of Yellowstone was made off the coast of the Philippines. Jenny Ann Barreto, a marine geologist, and her team 
found a caldera from an ancient explosive eruption that once occurred in the depths of the Philippine Sea, with it measuring a staggering 150 kilometers or 93 miles in diameter, making it the world's largest caldera. But how destructive would this eruption have been? And would a volcanic eruption at this scale be more or less deadlier compared to one that occurred on dry land? Which, as we all know, creates some intense and pretty harrowing effects to lands near and far from them when they occur. Because of its position, with this eruption and the subsequent caldera collapse, did mega tsunamis or tsunamis in general get triggered? We're going to answer all of these questions and more as we take a look into the life and eventual death of the now extinct Apalaki supervolcano. The Apalaki caldera is located in an area that's referred to as a large igneous province. A large igneous province, or LIP, are massive areas of relatively short but seemingly non-stop volcanic eruptions that are fueled by a hotspot, meaning some kind of mantle plume is occurring here, which essentially translates to the occurrence of an upwelling of an abnormal amount of magma that's rising en masse from the mantle. These processes are unrelated to typical tectonic related volcanism and are still an area where more study is needed to ascertain the actual hows and whys behind their existence. But even though they're odd and we lack understanding of them, they're actually quite common and there's many of them all around the globe. So what we had here was some kind of abnormality in terms of the voluminous amount of magma that formed the Benham Rise, but fuel it, it did. And this area saw its first eruptions begin around 48 million years ago, before finally calling it quits around 26 million years ago. There's been a multi-phase volcanic history in the life of the Apalaki volcanic complex. Hotspot volcanism more or less gushes forth basaltic magma from the mantle in a spectacular fashion. So the first eruptions here were non-explosive. The release of a huge amount of basaltic lava occurred on the deep ocean floor creating pillow lavas, and eventually, over many millions of years, it would build up the height of the Benham Rise. But in general, the study has split the history of this volcanic complex into three stages. The shield building phase, which we just mentioned with the non-stop flow of basaltic lava, followed by the caldera formation and post-caldera late stage volcanism. It's important to mention that at its birth, the Benham Rise began at a depth of 5.2 kilometers, or 3.2 miles in the deep ocean floor. Subsequent basaltic eruptions built the rise up by 2.7 kilometers or 1.6 miles over the course of about 6 million years, leaving it submerged by about 2.5 kilometers or 1.5 miles at its crest. So in the course of about 6 million years, the eruptions turned from effusive to much more explosive, and the present day massive caldera occurred at some point before 41.3 to 41.5 million years ago. Bathymetric data revealed it's a complex structure with multiple collapse events that occurred here, with many ring faults aiding the collapse, meaning these eruptions got so intense that it fractured the surrounding land to the point of forming their own faults. We've seen this occur in a supervolcano in Australia. Actually, there's multiple ring dike fault systems formed by the many supervolcanic eruptions that occurred here, and the majority of them were entirely separate volcanic bodies. But in the Apalaki caldera, it's clear that volcanic activity continued time and time again because in its final stages, after the last major collapse occurred, we see little resurgent domes and post-caldera activity before the magma here finally went cold and solidified as the system here shut down for good. So what happened here? Why did the eruptions suddenly get so explosive? Well, there was about 2.5 kilometers or 1.6 miles worth of what could essentially be deemed a volcanic cap sitting above the points where the magma first flowed meaning magma got trapped inside the ground for longer, leading to more melt occurring and aiding in any potential chemistry changes. And now the surprising news is that these types of supervolcanic eruptions that occur deep in the ocean would actually do very little to affect us surface dwellers. It'd completely destroy the surrounding ecosystem temporarily due to the volatiles that this eruption would release, but because of how deep it actually is, it's very unlikely that it'd do any real damage beyond this. Don't get me wrong, if a supervolcanic eruption and subsequent caldera collapse occurred in a shallow sea, then the damage would be very, very bad and tsunamis of a terrifying size would accompany it, as history has shown us time and time again. But the eruptions that form them are always magnitudes below the type of eruption we are discussing here, which is one at a supervolcanic scale, 
But the deep sea completely messes around with things, especially the ash cloud. So fallout, nuclear winters, all of that scary stuff really shouldn't and probably wouldn't happen here. And neither would a massive tsunami. There'd be some displacement of water during the cold era collapse, but it's unlikely it'd be anything too bad in all honesty. And the area of displacement is largely confined. So thankfully, the largest caldera on our planet occurred deep, deep below the ocean. But rest in peace to all the fishes that were unlucky enough to be caught up in it. Now, just because this supervolcano popped off deep below the sea, doesn't mean there wasn't hell here. Pyroclastic flows still occurred. Lava flow still raged post caldera collapse, and this area would have been a terrifying place to be chilling when this guy threw a fit. But he burped his last volcanic bomb about 26 million years ago. And now all that remains is this truly incredible freak sized caldera. The fishes can now rest easy. Thanks for watching. In the northernmost tip of our planet, within an area of ocean located only a short distance away from the tundras and boreal forests that dominate the Arctic, the crust of the Earth is literally tearing itself apart. This is the Arctic Mid-Ocean Ridge, and this is the area that marks the line where two massive tectonic plates are literally tearing apart from one another. But in this Mid-Ocean Ridge, we have something rather peculiar occurring. For some reason, one of the largest supervolcanoes that we've ever discovered erupted here quite recently, with it occurring around 1 million years ago. This is strange. Mid-ocean rift zones are never associated with explosive volcanoes of this caliber, making this the first time we've ever really found something like this. I mean, this supervolcano released an eruption that was literally larger than the Lake Toba super eruption that occurred some 75,000 years ago. And not only was this eruption dramatically large, but researchers said, and I quote, We consider the described caldera as an evidence of some new form of volcanism related to this type of plate boundary, meaning this volcano seems to have rewritten the rules of volcanology. These types of events form something known as a rift zone, and rift zones are unsurprisingly very hostile environments to be near when they are active. They can occur in the ocean, like this one did, or on dry land like the one that's currently forming in East Africa. If this supervolcano existed in a continental rift zone, I wouldn't be surprised at all that an explosive supervolcano formed. But since it formed in an oceanic rift zone, this raises so many questions. So in this video we're going to touch on that and more, as we endeavour to find the answers to several questions that I have about this supervolcano. From how large the eruption was, to why it occurred in the first place in the middle of an oceanic rift zone. And I'll also touch more on why it's so strange that this happened here in the first place. The two plates responsible for forming the supervolcano in this discussion are the North American and Eurasian plates, which are moving away from each other at a very slow rate. I'll come back to this fact later on. The area where we can find this supervolcano is called the Gackle Ridge. And to no one's surprise, the eruption centre itself is called the Gackle Ridge Caldera as a result of this. This entire depression here is actually the caldera. This volcano is actually still active, and it last erupted around a million years ago. So it's currently priming for its next major eruption right now as you watch this video. So back to the tectonic event that's fueling it. These kinds of rift events are more formally known as divergent plate boundaries. And as you can probably imagine, the fact that two major pieces of crust that were once sutured together are suddenly ripping apart is creating the perfect environment for pronounced weaknesses in the land to form, as the crust here thins ever more as this stretch continues, creating major faulting and fracturing to the rocks that line it in the process. When this occurs, magma readily rises from the Earth's mantle due to buoyancy to fill the ever-expanding voids utilising the newly formed fault lines as a conduit to do so. When magma does this in an oceanic setting, the results are usually major lava flows and volcanoes that erupt in a similar fashion to how Hawaiian and Icelandic volcanoes do, with low explosive but highly effusive eruptions that pour a voluminous amount of mafic magma out. And in this case, it does so on the ocean floor. The reason these lava flows aren't normally explosive is because the magma itself stays true to its chemical origin, 
meaning as it rises from the mantle, it doesn't really change in its chemical composition all that much as it makes its journey upwards. And it remains as a magma that's low in silica and is mafic in its origin, meaning it's high in magnesium and iron. But to keep this simplified, we'll refer to these rocks as basalt, even though there are several other mafic rocks, but basalt is the most common. So basalt rises from the Earth's mantle and erupts as lava on the ocean floor. But if this happens in a continental section of land, such as what is occurring in East Africa, then things are far more dangerous. Because as magma rises from the mantle, it will melt the rocks that line the crust of the East African landmass as it ascends. And when it settles in the magma chamber, it'll do much of the same, with the magma melting the rocks lining the walls of the chamber. The reason this is bad is because continental rocks are normally high in silica. So when this low silica magma from the Earth's mantle rises, it makes contact with these high silica continental rocks and readily melts them and incorporates them into its own chemical composition, leading to a marked rise in the level of silica within the magma, creating the conditions necessary for major explosive volcanic eruptions to occur. Because viscous magma has the ability to trap in volatile gases, which in turn increase the pressure levels of a magma chamber. And this will lead to very dangerous explosive volcanic eruptions and to the formation of supervolcanoes. East Africa will in the not too distant future be the most dangerous part of the planet to live in as it will be dotted by major volcanoes and the next wave of supervolcanoes will be forming there. Mark my words. So now you know why it's so unusual to see an explosive volcano existing here and why it's even more weird that it's not just some explosive volcano, it's actually one of the largest super eruptions that we've found thus far on our planet. And it's been documented quite well, as the studies that are backing it are very thorough. So the Gackle Ridge is the name given to the rift zone, and the Gackle Ridge caldera erupted around 1.1 million years ago, with an estimated eruptive volume of 3,000 cubic kilometers or 720 cubic miles making it one of the most explosive volcanoes on Earth to have occurred during the Pleistocene, which to clarify is the geological period spanning from 2.58 million years ago to 11,700 years ago. And as previously mentioned, it's amazing because it's the only known supervolcano located directly on a mid-ocean ridge. The caldera is an impressive 80 kilometers or 49 miles long by 40 kilometers or 25 miles wide. And the caldera has a depth of 1200 meters or 3,937 feet, making it quite shallow in all honesty, which is bad, because that means when this absolute monster of a volcano erupted, the ash cloud went subaerial, meaning the plume more than likely exited the surface of the ocean and soared up towards the stratosphere, creating a volcanic winter in the process. The generation of a tsunami is possible as well, considering the strength this eruption reached and the amount of material that was released during it. Thin layers of volcanic material that were blasted from the vent were found as far as 1,000 kilometers or 621 miles away from the Gackle Ridge. But this isn't the only eruption that's occurred here. There's others that were released from the Gackle Volcano, but the one we are focusing on is by far the most powerful. It was so strong that it might have affected the actual spreading geometry of the eastern part of the Eurasian Basin. In present day, hydrothermal vents line the caldera, showing the fact that it's still very much alive and working hard within some cavernous batholith that's lying beneath the sea floor. But attempting to ascertain how this volcano formed to begin with is what fascinates me the most. We have some variables. Perhaps the best variable in this situation that can to some part explain what we see is the fact that this rift zone is the slowest to spread by a long shot when compared to other divergent plate boundaries on our planet, with it moving at a snail-like rate of under 1 cm per year. Compare that to the 4 to 10 cm that typical rift zones move at per year and you can see where I'm going here. There's a chance that magma is just becoming more confined and is pressurizing because of this. But there's also another variable, and that's the fact that this part of the crust and mantle are very cold. Earthquakes have also been detected at Gackle that originate from the mantle, which is very unusual to witness in a mid-ocean ridge. Gaps in volcanic activity occur here, most likely as a result of the aforementioned factors. And it appears that these occurrences are what may explain the majority of the Gackle supervolcano's existence, 
but more research needs to be done. Before we conclude, there's one more fact that I find fascinating about the Gakul supervolcano. Not only is it the only known supervolcano to exist in a mid-ocean ridge, it's also the only one that's known to erupt at a supervolcanic scale, from a magmatic fuel consisting of basalt and andesite, which are low silica rocks. Now that's some crazy stuff. I believe there's a correlation between the low temperature of the mantle and crust and the magma itself that's creating the conditions necessary for the explosivity witnessed here. This is just my opinion, but it's the situation that makes the most sense to me, because even though silica is the primary factor that's responsible for the viscosity of magma, an often overlooked variable is temperature, which can also play a role in viscosity. Basaltic magma is the hottest magma known to exist, but if there's something that's actively working to cool it as it rises, it's going to naturally lower in temperature and become more viscous as a result and this might serve to explain why Gackle exists. But I'm sure we'll know one day if there's any truth in my hypothesis. And this is why I love geology. There's no real hard or fast rules in this science. There's always some outlier or some variable that serves to completely baffle and contradict what we know. It's a science that's filled with adventure and that's why I'm so obsessed with it. It's a constant game of discovery to me. And the Gackle Ridge Caldera serves as a prime example of something that we really wouldn't have expected to exist. And yet, here it is. Thanks for watching.